Welcome to the Insight Meditation Center. Some of you might be new, so I'm the teacher here, Gil Fronsdahl. I'm quite happy to uh, do something very different here. Those of you who have been coming for a while, um, you know, this is different for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had been thinking until this afternoon that I would do it standing, because I thought you were supposed to stand to do PowerPoint. <laughs> but it just didn't feel right to me. I, 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 so this is the best, like, the closest I get to. So um, um, I thought we would take a minute to meditate. And you'll see in the course of the talk why a minute to be mindful is going to be important. Just a passing minute. So, yeah, so it's not a long time, so you want to get ready and set. <laughs> <laughs> so just be, sit quietly for a minute. Okay, so that was our minute. So welcome. So the title of this talk is Making a Difference, A Vision for the Role of Mindfulness in Society. And uh, the idea of giving this talk came when I had dinner with Paul Haller, who's the abbot of San Francisco Zen Center and a friend of mine. And we were talking about, um, partly about a lot of the developments here at IMC. The... uh, growth of IMC itself, the creation of our retreat center, which is happening this year, and other things going on. And uh, he turned to me and said, with great conviction or strength in a way that was maybe a little bit uncharacteristic for our friendship and for being a Zen master, and <laughs> I don't know what, he said, Gil, you, should, you need to give a talk about how mindfulness is entering into our society and a vision for that. Because this is a very important thing happening in our society. It's a beautiful thing. And um, it has a connection with what we're doing here at IMC. And I thought about it for a while and thought that would be a really nice thing to do. Because Partly because I think it's one of the really beautiful things happening in our society these days is the way that the practice of mindfulness, um, careful, deliberate attention, is coming and spreading uh, in a phenomenal way, which we'll see. And little bit is happening maybe in a haphazard way and I thought maybe it's okay to create a little bit of a vision, a wider vision for uh, how this is happening. So that's the title. But in case you thought that this was a boring title, (laughs) there's an alternative title. How 10 seconds in 1979 changed our society for the better. So that's supposed to kind of evoke your curiosity and listen better. What? Where's where this going? So this mindfulness that has um, now spread in many places in our society it has its origins in Buddhism. The people, the pioneers for it, clearly attributed to the uh, uh, coming out of their Buddhist practice, out of Buddhism. And so in that sense, uh, it's an import of a religious practice from Asia, from Buddhist Asia, from India, and um, that came and was brought to the United States and taken, it was taken out of its religious context and applied into our secular world. And the only thing that's like this in terms of an import from an Asian religion that is very similar is yoga. And uh, 
These are the two Asian spiritual practices that have been secularized in the United States. The um, yoga maybe came a little bit first in terms of its popularization, and it's spread really wide now. And you find yoga being taught in all kinds of places without any, anybody raising any eyebrows in most places. Um, and this, is, uh, this should be strange or Asian or mystical or mysterious. It's just basically kind of a good physical thing. And you can go down to the local gym here and, and you can choose between, a, you know, you can do, uh, what is it called, uh, step exercises or jazzercise or, you know, a variety of things. Or you can do yoga and it's all kind of considered the same. And so mindfulness also has been secularized, and, um, and it's a very interesting phenomenon to have these two things um, uh, be adopted, adapted in America this way. So the growth of mindfulness practice in the last 20 or 30 years uh, has, been, uh, has uh, started to grow exponentially. And there's a one number of ways we can see this. One is by looking at the number of books uh, that... <laughs> that have been published. And you see that uh, we're not even the end of 2011, and look how it's spiking. Um, uh, lots and lots of books are being published. And um, what's interesting also about this graph uh, is that if you go back to... Uh, you see the cursor? Yeah. So 1990, before 1990 uh, or so, before 1990, all the books that have the mindfulness in the title were Buddhist books. And after 1990, um, uh, uh, a minority of the books are Buddhist books. And nowadays, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Buddhist book with it being published in the current, this year, and it, because most of them are very clearly secular kind of things. So it's a phenomenal growth. You wonder where it's going to go if it's growing this fast. And what's interesting is in all the different topics that are covered. It's a phenomenal array of topics, seemingly almost every possible area of our life. Uh, psychological issues, mental health are, are quite prominent and big. Addiction issues are very important. A lot of books written on how mindfulness can help addiction, uh, recovery, the area of, of schools, children, teens, parenting. There's dozens of books on these topics. Creativity physical health, there's mindfulness and yoga, combining those two. There's sports, eating, there's sex. As far as I can tell, there's only one book so far on <laughs> mindfulness and sex. And I looked at Amazon, and it wasn't selling that well. <laughs> Work, finance, business, organizational development, leadership, coaching, communication, relationships, Women, a whole series of books on mindfulness and women, S few books on mindfulness and men, <laughs> social work, politics, law, travel, video games. <laughs> You'll see. There's a few books on Judaism and Christianity with the title of mindfulness in them, and, but they all come after this, this, uh, this big change around 1990. And uh, I think that uh, it's pretty obvious to me, or pretty, I, I suspect that, uh, they're somehow riding the wave or being influenced by uh, this whole mindfulness movement and choosing those titles. And then the, also the, uh, things on ecology and environment. So that's quite, quite a thing. So let, I'd like to show you just a few of the titles. Um, mindfulness and Psychological Issues is a big one. I suspect that um, this is one of the ways in which mindfulness has spread into our society <clears throat> is its usefulness in areas like depression, anxiety, grieving, uh, Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression has become quite popular and uh, seemingly very effective. There is books on mindfulness and parenting, like Momfulness, <laughs> Mothering with Mindfulness and Compassion. There's the Mindful Child. A big field has been mindfulness and work, and there's a lot of books on this, and also a lot of creative efforts by very... Uh, uh, competent, intelligent people who have a lot of, lot of mindfulness practice to see how they can uh, present it and make it useful for people in the workplace. Um, there's things like mindfulness and finance and business. I wondered what the Buddha would say about the Dharma of capitalism. <laughs> a guide to mindful decision-making in the business life. 
or mindfulness and money, the Buddhist path of abundance. <laughs> and it would seem that there's mindfulness everywhere. It's been in all kinds of areas of life that uh, it's applied, or it's for everybody, for everyone else in all kinds of circumstances. And so then, luckily, we have these books. Mindfulness for dummies. And this is where we have the one-minute mindfulness. So we're going to have, probably have to change the way we do Monday night at IMC, where we, we meditate for 45 minutes, and it seems like we do it for 44 minutes too long. <laughs> and, um, the, 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 and the title that had the most uh, interest in my family life at home, among my, my 13-year-old, was uh, this book. <laughs> those, of you, those of you who don't know, Angry Birds is an iPod, iPhone video game where you'd mostly destroy things and, uh, with your birds. And my thir- when my 13-year-old saw this title, he said, you know, the person who designed this book wasn't very mindful because you see the capital I in birds. So that was fun at home. And then, then my son was one who said, you have to have the, the graphic of Angry Birds for the sh- sh- show. So. <laughs> so it's applied in many different areas of life. Uh, it might be interesting a little bit to consider what areas it's not applied, uh, applied to. Uh, we, don't, we don't have currently a book on mindfulness and bank robbing. And, uh, but why not? It seems to be useful everywhere, right? <laughs> Or maybe that's an important issue to question. You know, where is it appropriate? How is it used? And where is it not? Does it does not have a role? Or is it not even... So this is, has to do with book publishing. And I think that... I know that there are book publishers now who receive good books from their authors where the author's title has nothing in mindfulness in the title. And the uh, publisher is saying, you need to have that mindfulness in the title. And so it's not just the authors. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a fashion. It's what sells. And... Um, so it's kind of a fad that's going on. But mindfulness is more than just a fad, I believe, that's a trend that's going through. It's also a tremendous amount of research is being done, clinical and scientific research, on the usefulness of mindfulness. And so here's a graph of the amount of research on mindfulness. It's increasing also exponentially, uh, up until 2010, here in this graph. So that's quite impressive, I think. So. Um, Maybe it's not that many uh, uh, research papers. These are all research papers. Um, but, you know, we have last year apparently something like 350 published. So uh, the growth of these research papers is impressive. Where's it going? We also have uh, the creation of um, mindfulness centers for the research and the, and the development of mindfulness program for our secular world at major research universities uh, in the world. And we have, um, so we have uh, the kind of the, the, the mother of them all is the uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School has a center of mindfulness in medicine, healthcare, and society. UCLA has a mindfulness awareness research center. Oxford University, where those of you who are at John Peacock's presentation this week, um, he, that's where he teaches at the mindfulness center there, the Oxford Mindfulness Center. And the University of California, San Diego, has a center for mindfulness. That's kind of impressive. The next slide has a lot of words in it. So I warn you, so you don't spend a lot of time immediately trying to read them all. But they show some 32 different areas uh, 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 in which medical research is being done around mindfulness, where mindfulness is useful or might be useful. And so you can kind of just glance at all the words and you kind of get a sense of uh, how diverse the research is. I wanted to mention just a couple of uh, studies, a little bit random how I found these, came across these, I thought it'd be interesting to see. Uh, Mindfulness uh, health of teens. So this was um, a woman who's uh, still local, right, Amy? Gina Beagle, uh, local here, who's who's been involved with teaching mindfulness to kids, partly through Kaiser and other places. And um, her study... uh, of 102 teens with mental health problems, 80% no longer had one or more of their mental health diagnoses after an eight-week mindfulness 
based stress reduction course. That's pretty impressive results. So you could say well, one study maybe doesn't count for much, but there are lots of studies that are um, showing somewhat similar results uh, for certain things, not for everything. Because of the results in the mental health world, um, the second bullet point here, in the, in the UK, the National Health Service has mandated mindfulness-based cognitive therapy as the treatment of choice for major depressive disorders. That's pretty impressive to have entered into the society that kind of strong way. Uh, here in this country, the National Institute of Health has funded over 150 research projects on mindfulness in the five-year period. There's been a study of a mindfulness program that Pam Weiss developed for Genentech. She's a spirit rock trained Vipassana teacher who very creatively repackaged the mindfulness um, so it uh, you know, just would work for that environment in a nice way. And her study, someone else came in to study her, her program and to research, you know, what were the benefits? And uh, the results of that study was that there was 10 to 20 percent increase in employee satisfaction among the people who took it, 50 percent improvement in employee communication, collaboration, and conflict management. And for companies that are trying to have a profit or make money, it's important, the, the, uh, the next slide shows the very important results of that study, that the return on the investment estimated to be $1.50 to $2 for every dollar spent on the mindfulness program. So in other words, they found it was cost effective to bring mindfulness into the workplace. There are a lot of companies now, uh, maybe still a minority of companies, but a lot of companies who are beginning to bring mindfulness programs into their uh, workplace for their employees, um, not just Genentech, the local kind of big biomedicine company. But um, uh, here we have Fortune 500 companies with training programs in mindfulness. And these are just the very big companies that have it. Uh, there are other companies as well. There's a, a, a recording company, a multimedia publishing company called Sounds True <clears throat> that uh, uh, says, it sounds true, we strive to practice mindfulness in every aspect of our work. And there are other companies <clears throat> where uh, mindfulness practice, the values of mindfulness, are seen as central to what they're trying to do as a company. Another area in which mindfulness has gone into is the public schools, or school, schools. <clears throat> and um, there's been research there as well on the results. And the Mindful Schools uh, organization, which is in Oakland, has done a lot of good work locally and for other places to bring mindfulness program into schools. Uh, they've done their own research. And in studying second and third grade classes being taught mindfulness, they had these results. Studying uh, conflict scores. The lower the score, the less conflict there is in the, in the class. So you have before our program, uh, uh, you have a certain score for conflict. And then immediately after the program, it dropped dramatically. And what's interesting is that the scores stay low. Some continue to go down for the second grade. Third grade, I don't know what's going on there, but they went up slightly. <laughs> so that's impressive. Uh, we have now in the United States an organization called the Association for Mindfulness and Education. And we have here in the room what the CEO, president, <laughs> there, Amy, right there, Amy Saltzman. And... Uh, and she, um, I'm happy to say that the beginning of this Association for Mindful Education was here at IMC in the conference room. Lots of meetings here. And now we have this, uh, and on their website, they list um, uh, programs that uh, the association knows about, uh, states, and this, uh, where they have mindfulness programs. Not the whole state, right? But this is where it's spread to. Twelve different states. So it's a kind of impressive. The Association of Mindfulness Education is, uh, was the first... Um, I think the first who, who created uh, had a national conference on mindfulness and education. That conference was also brainstormed here. And now it's gone off. And the next one, the third one you're doing? The third one on the West, West Coast. Coast is going to be next month here in Menlo Park. And she, uh, Amy brought flyers for it here. Um, I thought these were nice to read. So these are anecdotal kind of quotes. When I'm mad or sad, 
I practice mindfulness. First, you have to close your eyes, then you breathe out and in. The world would be cleaner and there would be less shooting if all schools had mindfulness. My guess is this was a student in Oakland where they do a lot of, a lot of the mindful schools works there. I feel like I have the courage to do anything, another student says. Here's a teacher on mindfulness in his fourth grade class. You can just watch them breathe deeply and settle down rather than lashing out. So it's kind of interesting, you know, the study of lashing out and the conflict scores and um, uh, mindfulness in sports. Um, some of you know the Ch- uh, Chicago Bulls and Los Angeles Lakers. Some of you know about Phil J- uh, Jackson. He's supposed to get some credit for doing that. He's a Zen practitioner who's the coach of these big championship teams. Um, what he did in 1993 was he brought in a Vipassana mindfulness teacher named George Mumford to be the mindfulness teacher for these, te- these teams. And this year, right after the Lakers won, beat the Celtics, the center, uh, Andrew Bynum, talked about George Mumford's work and he said, he just talked about mindfulness and not letting outside things distract you. Pretty basic stuff. But here you have a major sports team uh, finding va- enough value in mindfulness that they're, um, you know, they have a mindfulness coach or something. It's also entered into the prisons, and there was a study done of uh, mindfulness programs given to 1,300 inmates in Massachusetts. And after taking a mindfulness-based stress reduction course, the hostility scores among inmates dropped 7.5%. This was both for men and women. The scores for the women dropped more than for the men. But still, that's impressive. In prison, any kind of reduction in hostility uh, is a reduction in violence and makes the place more livable. Um, from an inmate to learn mindfulness, here at San Quentin, there's an Insight Prison Project. They've been a pioneer in bringing mindfulness to um, the prisoners at San Quentin. A prisoner said, I've learned about early warning signs and about recognizing when I'm about to get into trouble and then how to come back to myself. This stuff really works. I know what to do because I have choices now. So Jacques Verdun, who started the Inside Prison Project, he's been trying actively to bring mindfulness into the state prisons for a long time. And it seems now with Governor Jerry Brown, it's been mandated from the governor's office that there should be more meditation in all the prisons. So we feel like the doors are open now. So I I was able to accompany uh, uh, Jacques Verdun just a few weeks ago to Sacramento to have a meeting in the governor's office where we met with the governor's uh, chief policy advisor and two senior officials from the Department of Corrections to talk about bringing mindfulness programs into the state prisons. That's pretty impressive. And then a former gang member in San Quentin on receiving mindfulness training. This has become a slogan or that they use in San Quentin now. He said after he took the training, now I get it. Hurt people hurt. Healed people heal. Isn't that a beautiful little quote coming from San Quentin, a gang member? That's what he learned. So you see, it's grown a lot. And there's other kind of statistics I could show you, but after a while it gets boring. And uh, other places it goes into, but it kind of gives you the idea. So we can ask ourselves then, why is mindfulness found to be useful in so many different contexts? What is it about mindfulness? And so I have a few suggestions. One is that mindfulness is a form of attention that can be done in all activities. So whereas in contrast to yoga, you know, you're not going to do yoga in the middle of your board meeting. You know, you're not going to do yoga. I don't think you'll do yoga in the middle of changing your diapers of your kid or, you know, caretaking for someone who's dying or, you know, suddenly, you know, excuse me while I do downward facing dog. Um, Yoga is a wonderful thing, but it's kind of particular where and when you can do it. Whereas mindfulness, because it involves attention, uh, it's portable and can be used in, in almost any situation at all. Um... Mindfulness allows for self-monitoring and self-regulation in all activities. 
And this is a very important thing. Remember the prisoner who said, uh, now I see the early warning signs of trouble. So uh, you start seeing what goes on, see the choices you have, see how you're beginning to react, and you can regulate yourself and monitor yourself. Um, and so mindfulness is the kind of the window or the key to being able to do that well. Mindfulness is a basis for understanding and empathy in all social understand uh, situations. So if you're attentive and mindful, you're more likely to pick up the cues and then get pick up and understand what's going on. And so these um, um, important qualities of understanding and empathy are more likely to be present. So this makes it portal, makes it useful, makes it applicable. And this is, I think, one of the reasons I think it's become so popular. It's also become popular because it seems to be very effective. I don't think that if it, if it hadn't been effective, I don't think if people didn't find benefit, I don't think it would have gone very far. Now, this mindfulness movement that, um, um, you know, bringing this practice of mindfulness into our secular world, spreading out so wide, really began, was catalyzed and began really by one person. Um, and that was John Kabat-Zinn. And um, he's a PhD in molecular biology, so he's really well trained in Western science. He's a Zen practitioner. He was actually being trained to be a Zen teacher in the 1970s and a yoga teacher. And so you find in this one man a strong interest in bringing together these two different um, approaches to understanding our life. The approach through meditation, the inner subjective experience of mindfulness and meditation, and uh, Western science and the kind of the discipline and, of that science brings. And this is a big part of what was needed to get mindfulness into places where science was the language. And it was his insp inspiration to bring mindfulness, take, take it out of the Buddhist context, um, and, and formulate a program so it could be brought to clinical settings, hospitals, and, um, and benefit people who were suffering in a lot of pain, a lot of stress, and for people who medical system was no longer helping. And when he started off, he really tried to specialize in finding people who the doctors had given up on. They had so much pain. And so he said, send them to me. And he made sure that they were really committed, that they were, or, or motivated. And if they're really motivated to try to do, get help, then he said, then he had them go through their program. And he had d dramatic results uh, in ways that the, the doctors hadn't with their medicine and different things they had tried for these people. So it was, began with him, and it, it was an inspiration that he had. Um, and that inspiration, I think it's worth, um, has to do with those 10 seconds. Remember the 10 seconds? beginning, 10 seconds that changed our society for the better. This is how he describes. He says it happened in 10 seconds in 1979. I saw in a flash the long-term implications of what might happen, namely that it would spark new fields of scientific and clinical investigations and spread to hospitals and medical centers. That's quite something. You can imagine just kind of seeing that. And I think at first he says, you know, he kind of was shy to tell people. It's kind of like it was a big, big vision, right? Ambitious, you know, how could... But he started. And, and now we find 240 mindfulness-based stress reduction programs in hospitals and clinics throughout the U.S. That's phenomenal. And it's even more so in Europe. And I had the impression in talking with John Peacock, who's from England, doing this work in England, uh, that... Um, it looks to me like per capita, England's over, going to overtake the United States in terms of interest and programs and mindfulness. I think because uh, maybe England is not as quite as diverse uh, as some of the tremendous diversity in the United States that makes it difficult sometimes to spread. <clears throat> um, so this is impressive. Now I want to kind of change a little bit. I've talked about how beneficial it is, the usefulness of it all the places it's gone. What is mindfulness? Do we, do we know what we're talking about? And what I'd like to suggest is that three different kind of definitions or understandings of what mindfulness is. And why it's important to differentiate them is that um, there are differences. And when people use the word mindfulness, um, two different people not, might not be talking about the same thing. And might, we, might be, we might assume we... There's a lot of assumptions about what we're saying. 
So the narrowest definition, perhaps, it's a type of meditation. And sometimes people use the term to mean that they're, med- they're meditating. I do mindfulness means they do mindfulness meditation. I'm bringing mindfulness to the prison. For some people, it means I'm teaching meditation in the prison. For other people, they use mindfulness in simply a way of paying attention in daily life. So just a way of being present, mindful, greater presence of mind, attention to what's going on. You're not distracted. Your mind's not wandering away. Uh, you're here and attentive to what you're doing, what's going on. Um, uh, uh, a more developed understanding, or a broader understanding perhaps, is a, it's a particular approaches and attitudes for paying attention. So it's not just simply paying attention in any old way, because you can be a mindful bank robber, right? You can just be you're present and mindful and there. But I think most of the pioneers of the mindfulness movement are not trying to make better bank robbers. I think they would be quite disappointed if they found out that's where it led. Um, and so it's not just simply kind of a just open awareness of general being present, but it's often connected to being present or being mindful, being attentive um, with particular approaches to how to, be at, to pay attention and particular attitudes to how to pay attention, which we'll see in a, in a minute or so. So it's not mindfulness alone, but it comes packaged with some other things that co- it goes along with. And then the fourth way is for some people, it's a way of life. To live a life in a mindful way is not just to live mindfully, you know, paying attention all the time, but it uh, involves all, all kinds of um, related values, beneficial, wholesome, beautiful values that uh, people associate or come together with mindfulness. So it becomes a way of life which we'll also come back to in a few minutes. So an example of the third, particular approaches and attitudes for paying attention, is one of John Kabat-Zinn's early definitions of mindfulness. Where he defines mindfulness as paying attention in, particular, in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So it's not just paying attention, it's paying attention in a particular way. So people are taught or trained a particular way. And on purpose. This is a very important part that it's deliberate. And then in the present moment, and then it, the attitude of being non-judgmental is a very important part of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that, he, that he's taught. Not being reactive, not uh, being critical, not... not Non-judgmental also means not tying up your self-identity with what's going on, but just kind of seeing what's going on in a very open, generous, gracious way so you can see deeply what's happening and you can start relaxing. Other common definitions of mindfulness. Um, There's a book called Fully Present about mindfulness movement, the science and art of mindfulness that came out uh, this year. Mindfulness is the art of observing our physical, emotional, and mental experiences with deliberate, open, and curious attention. So here, it's an approach where you're not just aware to everything, but your subjective experience is considered central to what you're being mindful of. So your emotional, physical, and mental experiences. And the idea that you you bring curiosity to what you do is also important. The Oxford Mindfulness Center. Mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment with compassion and and open-hearted curiosity. So here, one of the new things here in this definition also involves compassion. So is mindfulness inherent in the practice of uh, compassion or does it include it with it and add it to it as part of the overall approach of what we're doing here? So an attitude that's brought So there's a variety of different approaches to teaching mindfulness. It's not just one thing. Depending on what additional attitudes, approaches, things are included as part of the training. Some people like compassion. Some people non-judgmental. Different things are brought in. Sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly. Now this idea of it being deliberate and on purpose is a very important idea. 
generally, when we're being mindless, our attention has been hijacked by the preoccupations of the mind. We get pulled this way and that way by our compulsive desires, our compulsive aversions, our fears, our fantasies, all kinds of things. It goes this way and that way. And we're not in charge. You try to be in charge, you try to be present, and your mind takes over. The mind has a mind of its own. And a hugely important part of becoming free, using mindfulness to become free, is to become free of the compulsive nature of the mind where it hijacks awareness and pulls us away so we can't really live a life of our deepest values or live a life purposefully, or live a life clearly and mindfully, freely here. If you're not free, if your attention's not free, chances are, are you're not going to behave freely either, that you, your behavior is going to be motivated by your compulsion, compulsions. So mindfulness brings freedom. This is one of the really important benefits of mindfulness practice. Mindfulness frees attention from being hijacked by reactive emotions and compulsive desires. The natural results of mindfulness, greater mindfulness leads to greater self-awareness, greater recognition of stress and its causes, greater well-being and happiness, and greater empathy. I've been a mindfulness teacher, a Vipassana teacher, insight teacher for over 20 years. And one of the things that has been very meaningful for me and very inspiring is to see and work with so many students where it's so clear that mindfulness practice uh, brings out the best of our human qualities and potential. The best of people come out when they're practicing mindfulness. It decreases greed, aversion, and other afflictive states. It increases compassion, kindness, peace, and ethical integrity. So you see that mindfulness can be connected to compassion, connected to kindness, to peace, to ethical integrity. It has, so there's a wider field, a wider scope than simply just being mindful in the present moment. And so now we're going to go to John Kabat-Zinn's more recent definition of mindfulness, which is really broad, surprisingly broad, compared to that narrow one he had in 1994. I use the word mindfulness intentionally as an umbrella term to describe our work and to link it explicitly with what I have always considered to be a universal dharma that is coextensive, if not identical, with the teachings of the Buddha. And here he uses this term, universal dharma, which people don't use the word dharma, perhaps, universal truth, the fundamental aspects of human life, of this life we live, something which is not exclusive to any religion, including Buddhism, but something that's kind of part and parcel of the human life. And, um, and so he sees that mindfulness is an umbrella term, and it kind of the universal dharma is considered you know, the, the, the greatest truth, most important truths that support our life, that live our lives, the important patterns of life, the movements towards freedom, the movements towards compassion that's capable in a human heart. And he, that's what he sees mindfulness as. So as an umbrella term. Now, I, some people uh, who are trying to bring mindfulness to the secular world will cringe when they see this. Because one of the criticisms is sometimes the uh, Christians get really afraid that it's going to be covert Buddhism that we're bringing when we're teaching people to pay better attention. So then the, you could ask, is the mindfulness movement a covert form of Buddhism? <laughs> and I would like to say emphatically, no. Rather, it is a way of cultivating universal and beneficial human qualities that are not exclusive to Buddhism. And I know some of the pioneers of this mindfulness movement, and I can say with confidence that they are not trying to foist Buddhism on the world, but rather they've seen tremendous benefits from practices that can be done, and they want to bring those practices to others. Having been a practitioner of Buddhism myself in Asia, I saw over and over again that Buddhist teachers there were not interested in that I become a Buddhist. They were interested that I, offer, that I that be introduced to a practice and get the benefit of that practice. And, um, and in fact, John Kabat-Zinn 
explicitly will say that he's not a Buddhist, even though he makes a strong connection between the two. So mindfulness... So for the pioneers of the mindfulness movement, mindfulness is a way to alleviate suffering and to create a more ethical society. So not just in alleviating suffering in, in one individual, but to, do, to change our society in some way, to make our society a more peaceful place or more ethical place, to benefit our world. So here then is kind of the, kind of the reason for this evening was for, to offer a vision for mindfulness in society. And what I hope to have somewhat conveyed here is the idea that mindfulness doesn't have to be only paying attention, but it uh, can be a way of being in the world that's connected to other beautiful, important qualities of the human heart. And so for me, my vision is that we create a culture of mindfulness that is as much about compassion, kindness, creativity, happiness, wisdom, and peace as it is about mindfulness. It is a vision of an ethical society where ethics flows from the natural sensitivity that mindfulness awakens. I have a great belief that when we tune in to our subjective experience, we begin to relax the tension that we often carry and begin feeling more fully our life and the life of others. It's kind of like the, the, the doors of the heart are open and the natural compassion, kindness, love that's in the heart uh, resonates with what goes on in the world around us. And then importantly, and society becomes safer for all its members. It's remarkable to, to listen to the people teaching mindfulness in the Oakland schools. And these kids, some of these kids are traumatized with violence, uh, gunfire, and they don't live in a safe environment. And some of these kids are eating up the mindfulness because they feel, in the moments they do mindfulness in the classroom, they feel safety. They feel, you know, in a way they don't feel at home. One kid was very, very touched by this. One kid, uh, they had to write little descriptions of what it was like to be, do a little mindfulness meditation in the classroom. And one kid said, um, uh, when, I, when I sit and I'm mindful, I feel like I'm sitting at the edge of my grandmother's grave. And how I heard that when I read that, his grandmother was a safe person and going sitting at her grave is a safe place, meaningful place, something very nurturing or meaningful. So society becomes safer for all its members. See, remember the scores? The conflict goes down, hostility goes down, all these things go down. I think it's beautiful. So in a culture of mindfulness, Mindfulness would be woven into our society. In education, children would learn mindfulness as a tool for learning and as a support for social skills. In the workplace, mindfulness would be valued as good for business, employee satisfaction, and productivity. In medicine and psychotherapy, mindfulness would be seen as a key component of effective treatment. It would encourage greater self-care and it would facilitate healing when a cure is not possible. In conflict resolution, mindfulness fosters open-minded approaches, decreases the power of destructive emotions, increases self-awareness of motivations, supports wise communication, and encourages empathy. In correctional facilities, we would have it. In personal and family life, where mindfulness supports healthy relationships, so then you can ask this kind of very broad vision, is this vision possible? Well, my re first reply, it is remarkable how much has already happened. It's quite something to see. And it's spreading out and out and out. And I'm quite excited by how many people are finding benefits from mindfulness have no idea about its Buddhist roots. To me, that's great. And uh, I just want to see the benefits go out and ripple out into the world. But there is much more to be done. So what's needed to let the benefits of mindfulness kind of move into our society more 
for society to benefit from it. I believe we need greater availability of mindfulness training programs. So we have, there has to be an invita- invitation by more places, the prisons, the schools, the places of work, that see the value of it and make these things more available. And we also need, I believe, greater access to the deep transformative training possible in mindfulness meditation retreats. That it's one thing to do mindfulness in daily life, to do mindfulness at work. It's a whole other thing to be able to go on retreat where there's an extended period of mindfulness throughout the day, maybe over many days, where you have a chance to cultivate and develop the strength and power of mindfulness, where you have a chance to go deep inside the subjective world and really kind of begin understanding the deepest motivations, the deepest places we're caught, the deepest places of freedom that are possible, the deepest kind of grappling with both our, the challenges within us and the most beautiful things within us. To really learn the full potential of mindfulness is what allows people to most effectively go out and teach it in all these secular places. And you know, John Kabat-Zinn, I don't, I don't think he, gets, he gets, doesn't get tired saying this. He's, he really wants the people who get trained to do the MBSR and hospitals and clinics to have a deep training in mindfulness so they can best teach. As a mindfulness teacher, Buddhist teacher, um, I want people to be really well trained so they can meet all the different experiences that people have when they do mindfulness practice. Mindfulness sometimes opens doors to people where they experience aspects of themselves that sometimes are difficult like the children in Oakland, one of the big concerns about bringing mindfulness to them is, will it open up their trauma? And then how are you going to deal with that? So there's a lot of thought and care going into this issue. But I think when people are deeply trained in mindfulness, like happens on retreats, um, they have much more capacity to be present for all the different things their students might be going through. So in this regard, there's a role for meditation retreat centers. Retreat centers train people who will contribute to a mindful culture. And retreat centers are a refuge where people can experience what is most valuable in our human nature. So it's not covert Buddhism, but does Buddhism have a role? So I I say here, I say emphatically, yes. Its role is to train people deeply. Buddhism has been doing this for centuries has uh, lots of understanding, lots of practical understanding about meditation, about mindfulness, about the mind, about psychology, how this works, that um, is still a really valuable resource. There are people who have been doing uh, practice for decades in the Buddhist world, deep practice, who have such a reservoir of experience that they are, that it's beautiful uh, what they can offer to others. So, Part of its role, is that I believe, is to train people deeply. It offers unparalleled opportunities and support for realizing the full potential of mindfulness training. And then Buddhism is less an ism than it is an open-handed offering of such training. So, an open-handed offering. Now, I've heard um, uh, that there's this little bit starting to be a kind of a view afloat that uh, there's Buddhism one point zero and Buddhism two point zero, and people like me represent one point zero, <laughs> and the two point Buddhism two point zero is oh those are retreats and there's retreats and meditation things, that's the old way, that's for those old old fogies the hippies whatever. But, you know, we're in the, it's a modern world, the new times. It's about getting on with things and doing things and being efficient and texting and doing all the things we do. And uh, in Buddhism 2.0, we don't do retreats. I've heard people say something like this. And I think, I think this is misguided. I think that there has to be some ability to stop the spinning of the mind that our society is so good at encouraging. And, there has to be, and the way to do that is to not do more in society, but to take a time out, take a vacation, 
and have an ability to drop deeply into oneself, to shed all the stuff temporarily so you can see much more clearly. And if we do this, then we can come back into the world in the Buddhist terminology with gift-bestowing hands. We come back with something beautiful to offer. We discover what's most beautiful in our hearts and we bring that beauty to the world. Retreat centers are still very important. And so now, one more time, I'm going to go back to those 10 seconds. Remember those 10 seconds that John Kabat-Zinn had in 1979? So the question is, where did those 10 seconds happen? What was the, when did, what was the context for it? Those 10 seconds occurred during a two-week residential insight meditation retreat that John Kabat-Zinn participated in at IM, IMS. I think it was quite significant that that's where it happened. He wasn't just kind of, you know, playing Angry Birds. <laughs> <laughs> there's something beautifully, beautifully, there's a beautiful creativity and depth and depth of understanding and intelligence and connectedness to oneself that happens on these deep retreats that allows something really important to happen. And and from that can come many, many gifts to our society. And in fact, our society has benefited in a number of ways, in unseen ways, from the gifts of people who have sat long retreats. And so John Kabat-Zinn is one of them. From, you know, it's from hats which kind of blossomed. Another interesting area that maybe you don't know is um, Daniel Goldman. You know, he has a book, a bestseller some years ago, called Emotional Intelligence. When he, uh, in some other place, he wrote about his work, he said, um, I have tried to present the Dharma so that the connection could not be proven in a court of law. <laughs> so he took all this scientific research on emotional intelligence and wove it together in a way that would be useful and very meaningful for us without the Buddhism. And I'm happy with that. I'm delighted. You know, I'd be happy if we didn't have any Buddhism. So, but it's beautiful that, beautiful that this you know, goes out this way. So John's thing, 10 seconds happen on retreat. I think retreats are important. So part of my vision for mindfulness of society is that we create retreat centers that can be the seedbed for changing our society for the better. And here at IMC, we're currently involved in an effort to create a retreat center here and nearby. We're about to get ready to remodel it and in a year from now have a place for it right here in the peninsula. But more than just for us, I hope that every community, every major community in the, in the country nearby, that there is a place you can go to do deep, silent mindfulness practice. And it's understood to be as valuable, a valuable thing for a community to have as having parks or having national parks where you go to feel kind of the specialness, the sacredness of being close to nature, that you have places where you can go into silence, go into deep retreats, and experience the deep uh, sacredness of silence, of the inner heart, the still mind, the free mind. And uh, I hope that that's what happens. I hope that uh, as this uh, mindfulness grows and as it spreads out into the world, there's a beautiful uh, feedback loop that happens between those people who benefited from the world um, having the chance to go on long retreats. And those people who go on retreats come back and bring the benefits to others. At least a few people. I think at least a few people so that there can be these um, kind of people who will seed our society with some of these values. The compassion, love, peace, integrity um, that comes, I believe, from doing mindfulness practice. Thank you.